Welcome in to the Hangtime Podcast. Sekou Smith here at headquarters in Atlanta. The NBA Conference Finals are in full swing, and my main man, John Schumann, joins me from Jersey. We're going to break it all down for you today with a little bit of break in basketball. Both series have taken a short hiatus, a couple days, to let everybody catch their breath, focus back on whatever we haven't focused on for all these weeks. Yeah, I'm sure, Shu, you've neglected your family, your house, your life, everything at the expense of the playoffs, as have I. We'll also touch a little bit on Mike Budenholzer heading to the Milwaukee Bucks as their head coach. Phoenix winning the 2018 draft lottery and what that might mean. And the combine is going on in Chicago as well. Don't ask about prospects. We don't know. Just don't even start. But anyway, Houston. I'm paying taxes in Texas now, Shoe. I've been there so often. And it's, by the way, it's 99 degrees when I left Houston today. 99. Uh, Rough. Hope, you, hope you're doing well up there in the, in the Northeast. What's, what's the temp up there? It's cool today. It's been raining the last couple of days, so that means I haven't been able to cut my grass, <laughs> which, as, you've, you know, as you were alluding to, has been neglected. <laughs> It, well, at least at least basketball goes on, my man. And and look, Rockets Warriors game two was it was hard to watch. Sean Paul and I were there at Toyota Center, you know. And and the Rockets, give them credit, they stayed their course. They did exactly what Mike D'Antoni said they would do, and the results were magically different from game one. Uh, big win for the for the Rockets. But shoot, I'm telling you, their targeting of Steph Curry last night. Physically, like, you know, basically, if you watch the highlights, I, you know, and I'm in the arena, so I'm watching it. And Dan Wykey from the uh, L.A. Times sit next to me, and we're talking about it the entire game. But when when you watch the highlights, back shoe, if you notice every made basket basically on the highlights, it's whoever Steph was guarding or Steph was hmm. supposed to be guarding or had, you know, whoever knocked Steph down before they made the basket or shoved Steph aside with an elbow to the face before the, I mean, I've never seen a dude, an elite superstar player, get manhandled like that physically on, on defense the way he did. It was it was shocking. I, I kept thinking about you, by the way, during the game, because we've had this eternal debate about who is their more important, more yeah. impactful player. And you you rightfully say that Steph changes the way they play offense. But again, I, I maintain it's Kevin Durant because – Steph also changes the way the other team plays offense on nights like last night. Well, I mean, that question depends on who they're playing and in what situation. Like over the regular season, I'll maintain that Curry is the most important. And in some playoff matches, I don't matchups. Their opponents won't be able to target Curry like, Mm -hmm. um, you know, the Rockets have. But Houston has obviously two terrific isolation players, two two playmakers that can attack him you know, better, probably better than any other opponent that the Warriors will ever face. So in this series, yeah, I I can, I can understand your argument um, a little better. One thing I know is, you know, with the uh, Hamptons five lineup (laughs) um, was outscored 64 to 46 in less than 22 minutes uh, in game two with Houston shooting 24 for 38 (sighs) against that lineup. Um, and yep. a, and that includes twenty one for twenty four in the restricted area. So they were getting whatever they me, wanted. Twenty one they're in in the two games combined. They're twenty one for twenty four in the restricted area against right. uh, against that lineup, which means they're getting to the basket and they're not and and uh, they're getting there successfully. Um, so that sort of is a call maybe for some rim protection um, for Golden State. And so we'll see uh, you know if there's an adjustment. In regards to lineups from Steve Kerr in uh, Game Three, I was I was raising this point with Sean last night and with some other people. Why is it when Steph gets done, you know, gets ragged out like he did last night, and and I was like, why do we, why are we so hesitant to point it out or to criticize Steph when he plays poorly like that on this big stage? And and bear with me, shoot my argument. And it's the same thing that applies to Chris Paul at a, in a, in certain respects when they get on a floor where there are that many guys physically bigger, stronger, faster, whatever than they are. Chris Paul makes up for it by being an absolute bully. Last night he was knocking people <laughs> everywhere. He's dipping his shoulder in it, somebody's gut on every possession to make up yeah. for that, you know, to make up for the gap in physical gifts, let's say, 
that you have. But Steph comes into the press room and he and he takes all the arrows. Like he knows he's he knew he played like crap and he knew that they had made him the object of what they were gonna do. He knew the Rockets were going after him. So he comes in and, and it owns up to it and he says all the right things and it and it dawned on me as he's talking post game, that's why we, that's why you don't kill him, because he doesn't come in and do what LeBron would do after he struggled or what <laughs> some you know what I mean? What some other guys might do I or say it. after they stink it up. Like Steph comes in and owns it. And I think that might be why people feel like, well, you guys take it easy on Steph or you don't kill Steph when he plays poorly. You want to. Like, you want to roast him for playing bad or for being, you know, the guy who's, you know, who struggles like that. But, I, you know, you, it's hard when the dude admits it, when he knows it, owns it, and then comes back. You know, he'll come back in game three flamethrowing. Um, and, and he'll have adjusted. But... Do you get the sense that we that we as a media uh, horde tend to take it easier on Steph when he struggles like that? I mean, you know me. I don't care what other – you know, like I don't – for me, it's – I just try to call it like, a, you know, yes, like yes, I see it. I know. When a guy plays poorly, you know, I, you try to distinguish between, you know, effort and execution. You right. know, like if a guy, you know, just misses some shots and, you know, he's playing hard and or if a guy gets – uh, picked on defensively, but it's not, you know, it's not an effort issue. Like there's some where, you know, guys just fall Stug asleep. It, yeah. Like we can go back to the first round. And I think Eric Bledsoe just lost Terry Rozier again in the corner. Um, <laughs> but with Curry, yeah, it's a size issue. And I noticed that the, the thing with, with Chris Paul and, it, and, it, and it brought me back um, sort of the mid two thousands when I would watch, you know, I was, covering a lot of Nets games and mm. I would go and I remember Jason Kidd wouldn't would guard the opposing point guard for most of the game and then in the fourth quarter like he would get the the toughest defensive assignment so right. say they're playing the Lakers in the fourth quarter he gets he, he gets he guards Kobe right and he was a lot like we've seen from CP where he he hand checks as much as he can mm-hmm. and he had that sort of reputation where the referees would get allow him to get away with a little bit more contact than uh, your average defender. And I thought that was just sort of a, an advantage he had, right. you know, kid. I mean, kid was a, is, was a, a big, strong Monster, guard. Yeah, too. 6'4", 200 plus pounds. But yeah, he would get in Kobe's, like in, in that example, he would get in Kobe's shirt, right? Yeah. And, and have his hands all over him and yes. dare the refs to make a call. And I see the same thing with Chris Paul, where like he gets switched onto Durant. He's right in his shirt, right? And he's, and he's pushing him. And he's making contact. He's basically daring yes. the officials to, hey, if, if you're going to call me foul, just call it. Like, and if you call right. me foul, great. Then we we switch back, and I'm, I'm not guarding him anymore, right? <laughs> right. So I, I feel like he there's a little bit of a reputation uh, issue there. And um, but it it, it 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 watching game one and game two, like, and seeing him, you know, sort of con- use contact and 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 be a little bit of a uh, a six three bully. Um, as much as he can, just sort of reminded me of Kid back in the day, you know, against the the you know the best offensive players in the league, just using contact as much as he possibly could. Yeah, he uh, to to say that he has a reputation for being a scrappy, you know, whatever word you want to use, man. When you see it on full display like that, he, I mean, he's it's unbelievable the contact that goes on um, in these games, and nobody you know uses it to their advantage better i mean it's it's shocking for a guy his size to be able to create the space he does but it's all hard work i mean it is difficult like watching him have to battle he dipped his shoulder i forget who was guarding him might have been naked dollar on one possession we counted like he did, on the replay they showed on the jumbotron and re- he dipped his shoulder into this guy's gut like four times and it was like <laughs> watching a running back bust through the line trying to you know, get through a hole, and he just runs over four linebackers. I mean, it was ridiculous. And I was like, man, I didn't realize how strong – you don't realize how strong Chris Paul is until you see him in that moment, like, you know, smashing into another guy who's 6'6", 6'7". It might have been Clay Thompson, um, where he just kept – I mean, he he redirected him, and CP kept going at him until he got what he wanted. 
has he has he been called for an offensive foul this year? You, I mean, I, I I can't I don't yeah, know if he I has. Mean, he's man, he's just so good. I mean, he really he's so he's, I like he, I think he's just going to keep doing that until they call. Yeah. Like he's daring the you know like I said he's basically daring the officials. That I was talking about more the defensive end, but like yeah. on the offensive end too. Like you know, all right, you, you know, listen as a little fight, dude, as yeah. a, as a shorter human being. I have no problem with Chris Paul using whatever <laughs> vices he has to to get his way. You know what I'm saying? Like, it, I appreciate it. I really do. Yeah. I'm, I don't knock him for it. I appreciate that he's decided I am going to go through you, you know, now that I'm 33 and can't go around you maybe, you know. And he's he's built himself up. You look at a picture of Chris Paul from, you know, 10 years ago, he doesn't look like the same dude in terms of how physically strong he is. He's still not a big guy. Uh, yeah. by NBA standards, but uh, it's impressive. I mean, and, and again, the Rockets, I maintain, Shu, that they have to spread the wealth the way they did in Game 2 if they want to win a championship, if they have any chance of beating the Warriors and winning a championship, more than they play to James Harden's ego in his preferred style, which is him doing what Durant did in game two, in, in game one as well. Because um, Durant's been fantastic, and I think his team his team can win with him playing the way he plays no matter what. But I don't mm-hmm. know if the – I don't know if I could see the Rockets not just getting through this series but winning a championship if it's going to be ISO, you know, hardened uh, so exclusively at the expense of P.J. Tucker, Ariza, Eric Gordon, and these other guys getting shots. But I don't think Harden's n- an unwilling to pass these guys. I don't think the he ball. is either. I know. I don't. I, think, I, agree. I mean, this is a guy like if you play pick and roll defense um, without switching, say you know a hedge or and a or, or or say even like a, a soft a soft coverage where the big man hangs back, mm-hmm. um, you know, by the rim, and he gets going downhill, and now the big man helps. Like he's he. I mean, he's he's. He's right giving there, it up, yeah. You know, right there with LeBron as far as, yes. you know, driving driving towards one side of the basket and then kicking to the, the opposite corner sure. and just throwing a dart to set up a guy for a corner three. The problem is, you know, when they're switching, now it just becomes a one-on-one game. And yeah. then the difference between, you know, the Rockets are switching too. The difference between the Warriors and the Rockets then is the movement away from the ball. Yeah. Like the Rockets have just been a standstill team all year long i mean that's what they do and whereas the warriors there's screens and cutting much more screens much more cutting going off right. away from the ball that now makes them harder to guard and opens up other things even if you're playing one-on-one with the ball yeah i, I like i mean i i know mike d'antoni said he wasn't going to change anything we all know there were obviously some subtle changes made to what they did, how, more they, effort too, how they played. But you know, the energy thought, and effort that he talked about that was absent yeah. in the you know, down the stretch in game one was certainly there. And and PJ Tuck look, PJ Tucker was fantastic. That's why they brought him you know, that's why they wanted him. That's why they wanted to add play a player like that who could not only carry it on the defensive end, but then was better than people probably realized offensively and you need him to knock down those shots in moments like that. I thought Eric Gordon was the unsung hero, though, and and several people mentioned that he was going to have to play at an elevated level um, for the Rocks to have a chance. I, I've never said that I felt like this was some kind of mismatch in terms of talent or Bill. I mean, I think these are two champ- heavyweight championship caliber teams. I just gave the Warriors the edge based on their seasoning, the fact that as a group they've been there. But to me, Houston's every bit the the powerhouse that the Warriors could be shoe if they can find a way to consistently play at the level they did in game two. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I think effort on defense was better. There was one transition sequence in the second quarter, which I was really like the the Warriors came down and passed the ball three or four times in in the first six seconds of the shot clock, and mm-hmm. there was a rocket there every at every rotation, and then they ended up deflecting that third or fourth pass and going the other way. Um, and I, I was just taken back. I even tweeted it it out that mm-hmm. that sequence uh, this morning after I watched the game, and I thought that was just something that wasn't there in Game One. And I agree with like Eric Gordon is maybe a um, a bellwether for Houston. He's got to be aggressive. Yeah. And you know, part of it is just you know makes or misses as far as shooting from deep. 
but uh, he's got to also just look to get to the basket and be aggressive. They're going to, you know, uh, focus on Harden or, or you know, get a, uh, have a longer defender on Harden. Gordon's got to be that other guy that um, comes in and, and, you know, continues to attack um, the Warriors' weaker defenders where they are. Yeah, I, I really like uh, I like where the series is headed. Um yeah, I'm glad it's. I mean, I mean, after the after the Warriors won Game One, you know, as from nervous, yeah. uh, uh, the neutral fans' perspective, it's <laughs> nice to have it. You know that it's not two zero going back to uh, Golden State. Yeah, Game Three Sunday, eight o'clock Eastern on TNT. Um, Sean Powell that makes that makes, that makes both games in Golden State interesting, right? Because yes. even if the Warriors Huge. win Game Three, then you know the Rockets still have a, sh- a chance. To, yes. you know, to, yes. to get back home court advantage. And, so for, and don't forget, it makes that a big difference. They went in there on opening night. And, and ruin ring night, you know, so they've they got win some confidence. Like, yeah, they yeah. can win any They have the ability to win. It's yeah. just a matter of, uh, you know, shots going in sometimes. Yeah. Are, are we going to get more shots going in for Cleveland? Because um, <laughs> on the other side, the Celtics and Cavs, Celtics up 2-0 with the series shifting to Cleveland. My man Al Horford has been killing it. And uh, glad to see him playing as well as he has. Uh, I love the young guys on that Boston roster. I'm, we're not going to get into the Brad Stevens, how much credit does he deserve debate? Because I think he laid it, laid it out pretty sweet. You know, when he said, Hey, you know, this, you give the credit to the players and, and he's not looking for any credit. He's not trying to be a glory hound, which I appreciate. We both know there are a lot of coaches in this league that want every ounce of credit they can get, <laughs> but um, good for him, you know, making sure that it remains about his players, even if, you know, the narrative coming from, from our colleagues is nonstop about how brilliant and genius Brad Stevens <laughs> is. Um, what's What's been the biggest thing you've, you've noticed, you that's allowed them, Boston, to to handle Cleveland the way they have? From afar, from watching it, you know, the, on my off nights from the games I'm covering, it just looks like fearlessness. Like the fact that they have no fear whatsoever of LeBron and or the Cavaliers, but it could be something more, more nuanced than that. Obviously you're watching it and you're seeing it up close. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I agree that there's that sort of intangible aspect to it, but you know, a, a stark contrast from Toronto where um, you feel like there was that fear factor or that intimidation factor, mm-hmm. um, you know, just on the, technical side of it one i think they've kept lebron from getting to the basket too much right um you know even when he scored 21 points in the first quarter in game two you know he only had three shots in the restricted area in that quarter five of his eight buckets came from outside the paint and i think if he's shooting threes or if he's shooting um you know a turnaround 18 footer out of the out of the post you know from the baseline or something i think they're fine with that um, the fact that they've kept him limited at the basket is huge. Yeah. Um, I wrote about it uh, between games one and two. He going into through the first two rounds, he averaged fourteen point four points per game in the restricted area over those first two rounds, and so so far uh, through two games, he's averaging just nine. Right. And um, you know, I think that's obviously priority priority number one, defending the Cavs, keep LeBron away from the basket. They've done that as well as he possibly could. Um, and so that's what I'm looking for in game three is can Cleveland find a way to get LeBron to the basket, whether it be transition, whether it be post ups, um, whether it be having him cut off the ball. Because mm-hmm. once he gets if if he gets gets some attempts at the basket, then you know, the Boston defense now has to react and then now they have to scramble and that will open up things for everybody else. Um, the one number that the other number that stands out is that Cleveland through the first two games is, has only one corner three on 10 wow. attempts. Um, Who made that one? Uh, that's a good question. I'm wondering if um, I mean, I know Corver shoots him from all over, but yeah. I was like, that's gotta be that, somebody else. Yeah. Part of that is that they've missed a few open ones, but mm-hmm. Boston is, you know, one of the best in the league at uh, preventing corner threes. Um, and if you look at the difference, you know, like in the Indiana series, the Cavs averaged less than two corner threes per game. Mm-hmm. In the Toronto series, they averaged more than five. And now they're averaging a half 
per game, you know, of, a corner three per game. And I think that's sort of a bellwether for them. It always has been their strength is mm-hmm. getting corner threes. Nobody is better at assisting corner threes than LeBron. Um, and so, like I said, like if LeBron can get to the basket, that opens up other things. And that's that's uh, one of the things they need to get is get some, get some shots out of the corner. Um, and then on the other end of the floor, you know, it's let's not forget that Cleveland is a bad defensive team, right. and like we've I've said it multiple times on this podcast, that only the Suns were worse defensively this year than the Cavs. <laughs> the Cavs were worse than the Sacramento freaking Kings on defense this year. That's a new nickname, and, by the way, the Sacramento freaking Kings. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and so, like that defense can be exposed by a. You know, and you don't have to have all the talent in the world. Now, the the Celtics have, you know, they're missing Kyrie Irving. They still have a ton of talent. They still have a lot of talent. Yeah. Um, But they have, you know, they through execution and knowing where their advantages are, they've been able to um, pick apart that defense. They've been able to get to the basket a lot better than the, the Cavs have. You know, they've shot well. And, you know, that defense can be like so... It's not like the Cavs are some juggernaut at all. You know, sure. offensively, you know, it's it's it, it's you know that's a, a, a problem for them this year or in this series. Mm-hmm. But the defense, I mean, this is who they are. So, like, you can beat up that defense uh, if you work for good shots. Did did they get a bit of false security after? Sweeping Toronto and and just manhandling the. <laughs> the Raptors the way they did did that did that have some of those other Cavaliers maybe thinking all right we you know we got this probably you know um but even still like through the two rounds six of their eight wins have been by four points or less um I know you, so, you've been saying that you've been saying that it's not I, like yeah, they're said, drilling people there yeah, yeah so it's not like they are you know you know game one in Toronto you know they they uh they won in overtime. Um, game three, you know, they won with the the LeBron's game winner. Um, so it's not like I mean, you could look at a four game a sweep and say, hey, you know, this team is great or this team dominated this team. But I didn't really see that. I mean, you know, games two and game four they won fairly e- relatively easily. But game four, you know, I think you know with uh, with Toronto down three nothing, they sort of um, let go of the rope. I didn't see a team that was definitely dominant, and I sure. also saw a Celtics team that was obviously a, a better matchup than than the Raptors were as far as how to defend uh, the Cavs. Right. Um, and so, you know, the Raptors did some things wrong, but um, it's not that that Boston's up to nothing shouldn't be a huge surprise if you've been paying attention, uh, you know, over the over the over the whole season. Yeah, I told somebody the other day, John, that. We forget Boston was the best team in the league early on and for a good stretch before Houston went galactic. You know, like Boston was the team. They would they went 17 straight. I think it was 16. 16. I mean, it was ridiculous. They yeah, had a stretch. Lose, yeah, they lost were just the first two games and won 16. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's not like they're, they've they come out of nowhere. Who's – and, you know, I'm partial to Terry Rozier. I've been, I've been hyping him up all year before he really went bananas here in the postseason. Who's your favorite of those young guys in Boston? Like, just in terms of how he plays, what you think wow. his ceiling might be as a player? Which one of those guys do you like best? I, I think and why? it's like a toss-up between Tatum and Brown. Mm-hmm. I mean, I love Rozier, too. and and But obviously, he's a small guard. Yes. And, like, the you know, the other thing, like, we, we were going back to that Houston series and, and picking on Curry. Like, the size in the backcourt um, is something that I've really sort of opened my eye. Like, I've taken notice of this year with mm-hmm. – how much Boston has improved just by adding size and on the perimeter and Philadelphia just being so huge on the perimeter. And so, I mean, I, I, I love Rozier. He's fearless. Um, he's hit some huge shots in this postseason. But just, I mean, the sky is the limit with both Tatum and Brown. Yeah. I mean, Tatum is, uh, I mean, such a uh, an offensive play. Like, we talked about this last week. He's how much he's grown offensively, where they're running the offense through him now. Mm-hmm. Um, Brown isn't that like he's not having the offense run through him, and you know they don't really 
do many pl- uh, draw up many plays for him, except maybe for like to come and shoot a three off of a pin down. Um, but he's just got a complete game, and you know, like, and so I was having this discussion with with somebody uh, in the last week and talking about like, oh, the 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 idea of trading one of these guys for like a Kawhi Leonard or something like that. And I looked at, I was just like, man, but couldn't Brown just be just as good as Kawhi <laughs> Leonard at some point? Like, I, you know, like, and and they're they're huge. Like I said, they're big, and they've already shown like a, as young as they are have proven to be good defenders and like to see that in young guys is 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 rare yeah um and like i said and and to be able to play on the perimeter at their size um handle the ball um shoot from from deep just makes them so so valuable i mean this is you know the warriors and the celtics have taught us the 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 value of a versatile you know six eight six seven six eight six nine uh forwards um, you know, and, and, and so like, I don't, you know, I, the sky, I, I don't have a preference with either guy. I just, yeah. you know, I'm just can't wait to, to watch these guys develop and, and that they're doing what they're doing right now is just amazing. Uh, you know, the scary part for me, if you look at those two and how dynamic they are right now, would they be more dynamic than a Hayward and a whoever else would normally be there? <laughs> I'm like. And I'm not knocking Gordon Hayward. He's an all-star. He's, you know, guy who's done fantastic things in the league. But it's like, man, these guys are 20 and 21 performing like that on, you know, in the playoffs. If I'm not mistaken, both of them have had some some milestone things. You know, Tatum with the however many games he's had with 20 points in the playoffs at that age. And then Brown, the youngest to have, what, a 30-point? Some I forget what the stat was, okay. but I mean this is this isn't you know run of the mill stuff. We're talking about two guys who potentially could be franchise pillars in Boston or wherever, with the ability and, and to me with the talent, the youth, and the fact that they are modern day like they're to me they're perfect players for today's NBA. So versatile, can shoot, you know, from distance, strong enough and you know, big enough to play from the from the three point line all the way to the rim, and then they got the kind of makeup. Like Brown is so mature. Like you listen to him talk, it's like this dude's twenty one. You know, and Tatum, <laughs> yeah. you know, he talks like a dude who's. I don't know. It's just like I think you can get intoxicated with all that talent and what they're doing right now, and then you forget what they have in the wings, and then the assets that Danny Ainge has working for him that he could go out and actually turn into somebody else, and and. I'm a firm believer, Shu, that if I'm a championship team or if, if if I can compete for a championship now, then I'm not chasing free agent names when I have that kind of talent in house. Now, if I was a player away, if I'm Philly and not Boston, then I'm looking at all my options and saying, okay, I'm one or two players away. I'm one or I'm a Kawhi Leonard away or whoever away. To me, Boston. It would be rash, to say the least, for them to start talking about moving one of these young guys and shifting this over here and, hey, we're this. And let. I think that's crazy because, to me, when you can build it organically, you know, when you can do it in-house and have guys that you draft, bring into your program, watch them grow and develop, I never value that over the quick fix that you think a free agent might bring unless it's a LeBron or a somebody – who's so beyond the you know the pale in terms of ability and star power that you you it's like a it's a no brainer. I'm not saying Kawhi's not at the highest level of type of guy you could get in the league. I'm just saying I'd be careful if I'm Boston messing with that kind of chemistry and what with what we have going on as a as a group with all those guys. Well, the other thing to take into account is their contracts. I mean, yes. Brown still got two more years on his rookie contract, and Tatum still has three more on his rookie contract. Yes. Whereas the guys like Kawhi Leonard and Paul George and LeBron, those are guys that make upwards of thirty million a year. You know, and like that's a that's a huge um, salary yeah. uh, in today's game. Like I, I think there are 
some guys that make the you know the 10 year max or even the super max right now where you're looking like hey you know this guy's going to be making 45 million dollars a year um two years from now and that's going to be tough to deal with you know like as far as our uh our cap and so the fact you know you can't not take that into account when you're talking about the value of these guys um, in the near future, um, you know, next year or whatever. And like I said, yeah, I mean, if I think these playoffs have um, sort of solidified their status as, as guys that are keepers and guys that will, would, you know, it would take, you know, that, you know, someone would really have to, yeah, you know, like that they're close to untouchable, I guess, is what I'm trying to say, you know, as far as trades or anything is concerned. I just <laughs> I'm thinking, you know, we've changed our conversation like three times this year, this season about who might be team next. Like who's going to be the, you know, everybody's infatuated <laughs> with team now. Forget exactly. Team next. <laughs> exactly. It's like the Celtics aren't waiting. You know, the Lake. I know Lakers fans think they got the best, young. you know, who's got the best young core in the league? <laughs> the group's still playing in green and white. Yeah. How about that? I mean, it's not even close yeah. right now. How about I mean, that? I mean, the the Sixers with Embiid and Simmons. I mean, that is incredible. And we got a and and obviously the next ten months are going to be huge as far as that third that as far as Marco Fultz's future is concerned. Right. Um, but I mean, what a story it would be if the Celtics make the finals oh. without Hayward and Irving. Ridiculous! I mean, it's incredible. Yeah. And and just I mean, right now they're the first team in the East since. In the last eight years, that has been up two games in a series on LeBron. So, Crazy. I mean, it's, you know, it, we're, we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit to, to, to think about that storyline, but not that much. Not yet. You, know? you better eat two by me's while you're in Cleveland because um, that might be all we get. Just in, <laughs> <laughs> just in case that's all we get. You better be at the Full Tank Cafe bright and early. Tomorrow um, night. Tomorrow night I land at uh, – uh, <laughs> I think I land at seven forty-five. You know they better have my bomb me ready by uh, eight thirty, eight forty-five. <laughs> I can't tell you how many Smart people, enough. by the way, have mentioned it to me about us hyping up the bomb me sandwich, <laughs> fight off bomb me sandwich. It's, it's the bread. It's about the bread. You know, it's <laughs> the the size of the roll and, and the softness of the bread is what what's what makes it uh, stand apart. I like it when we go foodie on the Hang Time podcast. <laughs> Shoe, what's up with the Schumann stat this week? We've been neglecting the Schumann stat here recently. Give me something. Right. Give me something I good. I have a little bit of 2018 playoffs trivia oh, no. for you. Oh, man. I don't have any backup here today either. Uh, John, uh, you and Hannah are going to have to, like, chip in here since <laughs> GA's not around to cheat and look it up on his iPad. All right. <laughs> so there are six players mm -hmm. who averaged or have averaged at least five points per game more than they average in the regular season. Okay. So in these playoffs, they've averaged at least five points per game more, more than, than they, they did during the regular season. Yeah. Right. Two of these guys are still playing. The other four are not. Okay. And I'm looking, and all the other four were eliminated in the first round, actually. So Wow. So two guys still playing. Okay. More po five, At least five points per game more than they average in the first, in the, in the regular season. Right. The two guys still Ooh. playing are both in the East. I'll Both in that. the East. So who got who? Well, that makes it easier. At least it narrows it down to two teams. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Big jump on the Celtics. Yeah. Uh, Mostly gotta, due to playing time. It's got to be Rozier. Rozier. Correct. Yeah, he's got to be one he, of them. Uh, I mean, just the amount of time he's gotten is yeah, so much more. Seventeen point four per game in the playoffs, up from eleven point three. Right. Uh, in the regular season, the other All guys right. on the Cavs. <sighs> I'm trying to think. Give me a second, because I'm trying to think who's been getting, who's seen that uptick in their minutes. Eesh. Uh Cavs, Cavs, Cavs. What about? Man, that's that's a tougher one. Uh, it's right in front of your face. Mm. They shoot. They're not exactly tearing it up with their postseason. Well, one guy is averages. Um, one guy is. Is it Kevin Love? No. No. Is it that suburban jump shooter from uh, New Jersey? No. Dang it. Who's their best player? Who's been tearing it up? Oh, well, duh, LeBron. 
Right. 33.4 points per game. He doesn't count. We can't put him in. in he can't get in the Schumann stat. No way. Mm-mm. We He's can't allow LeBron in this. Oh. All right. So the four guys <laughs> that were eliminated uh-huh. averaged. All right. One on uh, Portland mm-hmm. averaged almost eight more points per game in the in getting swept the than he did in the regular season. Uh-huh. Who the heck? Good Lord, shoe. I'll give you like 10 seconds on this one. Then I'll uh, tell you what the answer is. A starter on Portland. Chief. Yes. Al Farouk. Al Farouk Aminu. Yep. Averaged 17.3 up from 9. He always balls Aminu. in the playoffs, so he, do, he always balls out in the playoffs. <laughs> He's my dude. All right. The right. Let's see. One uh, from Washington. Not the Morris twin. Nope. No. Uh, Big scoring jump. In part, he was uh, injured for uh, much of the regular season. Oh, and it's not Ty Lawson. Ty Lawson didn't play in the regular season, so he didn't have a scoring average. In the, right. Uh, I was going to say, uh, <laughs> how big of a jump could you get on that roster? I mean, not a- So this guy went from 19.4 in the regular season to 26 in the playoffs. Mm. Bill, Bill did that much? Nope. John Wall. Or was it John Wall? Yeah. John Wall. Uh, for Minnesota, this one might be a tough one. Averaged uh, 14.2 in the playoffs, Mm -hmm. uh, losing to Houston, up from 8.4 in the regular season. He only played 25 games in the regular season. What about D. Rose? Derrick Rose, yes. He he definitely made made an impression on me in that series. And the last one from the Miami Heat. Well, I I hope it wasn't uh, Whiteside because I don't like talking about him. (laughs) It was definitely not Hassan Whiteside. (laughs) So as long as we keep Hassan Whiteside out of the conversation, I'm cool. Um, What about... James, nope. Ja- oh, uh. it may have been this guy's last postseason ever. Oh, D Wade, Dwayne Wade, wow. sixteen point six that. in the playoffs. That series versus Philadelphia versus eleven point four in the regular season. He, based on his Instagram feed, he looks like he's really enjoying not having to think about basketball right now. It's a good, it's a good life now. He's he's got it all. He's going to the Hall of Fame. He's got everything. He's got the superstar wife. He's made all that money. He's world famous. He wears knickers in all kinds of crazy fashion. I mean, you couldn't ask for much more than D Wade right now. He's doing good. Yeah, I mean, I'm not mad at him. I'm, 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 I'm impressed. It's um, gonna be hard to hard to make that decision though. Uh, if you if you love if you to love play. the game the way he does, yeah. But yeah. you you know he's not a spring chicken anymore. And you remember when he was young, we used to talk about what his playing style would do to his body one day. You know, it's not. It can't be easy getting all those deep tissue massages and trying to get back out there and play all the time after I've all the work before, he's put in. I said it before. I think he made a mistake in not doing the Jason Kidd and developing a three point shot. Yes, you did. You've, you've you've said that for years, and I agree with you. I think he. I think he still could be a point guard without it, though, in this league. Like he could be a facilitator in Miami off the bench. Even without the problem being a with that team is shooter. they have a bunch. The problem with that team is they have a bunch of other guys that, that are yeah. versatile players, forwards and, shooters, and yeah. three slash fours who can't shoot. Yeah. So yeah. Um, that's why he's a that's not a, kind of a tough fit on that team. And if that's the only team he says he wants to play for going forward, well, it makes it tough. Yeah, that's an issue. I love it. Um, the Schumann stat baby makes its return here on the Hang Time Podcast. We cannot go two weeks without a Schumann stat. That's not. We're depriving the public right. of of something vital to uh, to our basketball economy. Shoot, Mike Budenholzer is off to the Great North well, Midwest, going to Hartzell Land to uh, to coach the Bucks and Giannis. Is that a no brainer when you're a coach and somebody says, "Hey, we need to we need you to come in and coach Giannis Antetokounmpo in a young roster that has a chance to be a team on the rise here for the next however long in Eastern Conference." You, if you're Budenholzer, you you take that meeting and say, "Hell yes, I want I want to see what I can do with Giannis." Absolutely, yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think that team is is ripe for being molded on both ends of the floor. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they had a, a top ten offense this year, um, but as we saw in the playoffs, like there's just too many possessions that didn't go the right. Like, I think there's it that offense can be rehauled, uh, overhauled, and. Um, made more efficient. I think he's he's from what we saw in Atlanta that one year yes. where they were really good. I mean, that offense was was beautiful. Yeah. And um it's a matter of do they have the shooting and the personnel to to to, to pull it off. Right. And, you know, and it's got to be guys willing to give up get off the ball and move the ball and, you know, uh, 
Ansa de Kumpo has to uh, develop his jumper, but I think he could really uh, come in there and really do a lot of things for them on both ends of the floor. And, and we shouldn't forget that the Hawks were mostly a good defensive team under yes. Budenholzer than they were an offensive team. You know, so. you know what I really feel bad about that. It's so easy to say Giannis's last name now, like after you said it a million times. But for how many years, so many people struggled to pronounce it. It's like, and this is from a guy who's had his name butchered for the better part of the last forty years. Um, so there's like a there's an NBA TV researcher that you, you you and I both know well. Yes. That every time he sends out his Bucks notes, right? It's just he writes like the Greek freak and like colon, you know, thirty five <laughs> points eight rebounds, six assists, and that just bugs me. Like, you know, like... <laughs> well, now that person knows. For, for, like, uh, when I do my game notes, it's always Antetokounmpo. Like, I right. don't even write Giannis. Like, I, for some reason, I'm a... Maybe uh, it's just the person I am, but for, re- oh, for some reason, when you just call him by his nickname or something, like, you know... You think? Maybe, anyway. It might be us, you. Maybe it's just us. Um, <laughs> <laughs> draft lottery. Phoenix wins the number one pick. You know, and we're not gonna we're not gonna dive into what they do with it. But is this? I'm more interested in I'm more interested in in what their new coach can do than yeah. what they get out of that number one pick because I think they have they've some got talent. some talent in in house already. So the it's number one just, pick to me needs to be a complimentary piece to what they've already got. It's just that they've just been like the mo- most yeah. uncohesive team yeah. in the league. I think for like the last two years, two three years, yeah. Where you know, even when Bledsoe was there, it was just a bunch of my turn, your turn stuff offensively. Mm-hmm. And so I want to see a system that can really make the most of, of Booker, make make him, you know. A better player, yeah, shoot, better all yeah, player, have him, yeah. Yeah, have him shoot off the catch more than he shoots off the dribble. Yes. Have him, you know, uh, uh, more of a playmaker than he's been. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, it's, it, I'm excited that they're going to add another piece to that. But, I mean, they have, you know, in addition to Booker, some interesting young guys They just – you just don't know what to make of them because, um, like I said, they've just been un- so, you know, uncohesive yeah. over the last couple of years where it's it's been kind of a mess. We're going to get a chance to see what happens. Uh, NBA draft coming up. Uh, That's By the way, that it. coach's name is one that I have to learn how to pronounce uh, before uh, I, I'm as comfortable with it as I am on Um Let's just call him Igor. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, that just... I can't do. <laughs> anyway. Can't call him by his first name. No, yeah, I guess you can't call him by his first name. Before we get out of here, I just want to reiterate one more time, I'm very unhappy with the Toronto Raptors' decision to relieve Dwayne Casey of his duties. Not that we, you know, we didn't think it was a possibility. I just I still don't like it. Even after a few days to, to let it sink in, I don't like it. I don't like it. I don't like it. Good. And the and the Boston series is, but the Boston series is telling us, and the Indiana series before it, just telling us that you know this Cavs team is not that good, and it's a just it's just makes the yeah it, it, the, it the, the, that series more, more yeah. of an indictment on the Raptors, yeah. and whether it be a little bit of Casey and a lot of the players or whatever, um, you know how disappointing that series was I for agree. that team, considering the season that they had before that. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. Um, I don't know where GA is. Uh, you know, he's he's off this week. We gave him a little breather. I think we he's somewhere with Rick Fox. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's somewhere keeping up with hoops. I mean, you know, his. I don't know if you noticed, but GA's son is blowing. I mean, he might end up being the number one recruit in the country next year. Point guard mm-hmm. Cole Anthony. So, you know, we're going to spend quite a few podcasts. I could see in the in the future talking about Cole Anthony one way or another because. I'm trying to get him to. I'm trying to get GA to send him to Michigan for starters, which is the first tampering and uh, NCAA rules violations that I'm going to be committing. Um, but he's also probably going to be in the league before we know it, so we're talking about him as well. Uh, shoot, we're getting close to that time where these conversations will be happening in the flesh. The finals are, are going to be here before we know it. So uh, finish off the Eastern Conference Finals. I will try my best to get the West wrapped up in whatever time the Warriors and Rockets allow. And then we'll get on with the getting on and trying to figure out who's going to win the championship this year in the NBA. If you haven't already, subscribe to Hang Time on Apple Podcasts for new episodes all throughout the playoffs. And don't forget to leave a review. John Schumann, enjoy whatever hours you have left with the fam. I'm going to try and do the same and then get back on this playoff grind. I will talk to you next week, my man, and we will see everybody right here next week on the Hang Time Podcast. 
Thanks for listening to the Hang Time Podcast, and be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts for a new episode every Thursday this season. And as always, say Kuna Matata. <laughs>